You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. All right, guys, welcome. Welcome to an atypical episode of RX Radio. Um, first off, hope everyone's staying real safe and, and you know, enjoying the self-isolation, as it were. I am recording this into the sultry tones of whatever music is playing uh, at the gate in the Vancouver airport trying to make it to Australia. This episode will actually air uh, likely while I'm in the air. Um, so had a lot of interest uh, since kind of all this crazy shit was going on. If you want my opinion? Uh, I don't know message me on instagram i don't want to perpetuate more bad information out there um but that being said i had a lot of interest now with people having extra time off i go to the psl1 course a lot of people are working from home and kind of looking to maybe upskill while they have the time so we're actually going ahead now and if you go to prescript.com slash courses the level one course is going to be um, available for registration we're moving the, the semester forward is to accommodate for many as many students as we can understanding that look like you guys have some free time and you know make the most of it like this is something that i challenge like a lot of my clients to do is you know this is not a time to take the foot off the gas like when everyone else is kind of taking it easy and making jokes this is where you get some serious work done um so in the in the light of that or in spirit of that we'll be starting the uh spring semester of the psl1 course online uh in the next couple of weeks so space is limited um so do get your tickets I'll, Great feedback from the last episode with Killian Hamilton. You might see his head popping in for a few of the lectures. Junta might be joining us as well. Um, so we're really going to be all hands on deck for this to try and, you know, make the best of a bad situation. Um, so again, hope everyone's staying safe. This episode, really neat episode incoming. Um, you know, the one of the brains of this operation, uh, Dr. Clementina Russo, like light years smart. Uh, really lucky to, ha- lucky to have her on. Um, just gives a little bit of insight as to some of the inner workings of what we're doing at Prescript. Um, and with people like her at the helm, um, well, even idiots like me and Jeff, I can't fuck this up. So I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Stay safe. Um, keep us posted on Instagram, social media at Red, White, and Jordan, uh, at Open Door Dining to find Clem. And then, uh, of course, at the underscore muscle underscore doc. Um, I hope you guys, hope you guys enjoy. Hope you guys, hope to see you guys in class very, very shortly. Um, and yeah, stay safe and enjoy the episode. We'll see you guys next week. So have you ever seen those fucking things that you put on like a cable machine, but it's a, a head harness? Well, they, they, there's an iron neck going around right now. Have you seen that? Does that go come up on your sponsored ad? W- what do you do? I don't know how it works. So it's basically <laughs> this, this harness that goes around the back of your head, up around your forehead. And then there's like a strap on top and it comes down. There's like an attachment for either a hook or like a chain with weights or a cable machine. You basically can go up and down with your head, side to side, like rotations. So I don't like that. think that's the iron neck, but there's like, because that's been around for a while. Like neck training is kind of like a thing. I just don't understand why you don't just get big traps. Like why not just do trap stuff rather than like SCM raises? Yeah. That's like doing like obturator internus raises with your hip. It's like me, start with the glute. Or just get punched in the face enough until you figure it out. Yeah, strengthen up that chin before you start doing things that look like you're practicing for the blowjob Olympics. Well, cause, well, maybe they are. But that's the problem is like the specificity in training implementations for sport are like, and I don't know if the blowjobs are making their way into the Olympics or not. Everything is a sport. Uh, that's not That's not at all the truth. I just think like it's so silly how specific people get. And it, I think it's worse than martial arts. Like mixed martial arts and like wrestling and, and like MMA and UFC and boxing, like some of the specificity, the hyper specificity you see in some of the strength and conditioning training, you're like, you know that they fight too, right? That that would be like them rolling around and then also bench pressing as they roll. It's like, no, no, no. When they fight, they're fighting. And when they're training, they're training. So train them to train and then fight them to fight. I don't really understand this idea of like hyper specificity. Hyper specificity is the sport. Right? You don't need to get more specific than that. Yeah, there's only so much that you need in training, and some of it should literally just be training. 
like get big. Most sports would benefit. Most athletes would benefit from an extra five or ten pounds of muscle. So in the off train, like on the off season training, like get the stimulus you're not getting while you're playing the sport. That's the whole point. Exactly. You want to build up that resiliency, build up the strength surplus in the off season. And then when it comes time to switch to specificity, you know, that's time for your drills and your, your technique work and that sort of stuff. That's like Killian told me, where is he? He's somewhere. He told me about like a hockey coach that had people doing pull-ups one over and one under. So supinated and pronated grip because that's how you hold the hockey stick. Who is doing that? Some dude from New York. Could you imagine that? It's like, if anything, like do it the other way to unwind the imbalance that you've been running into. Yeah, nailed it. Isometrics, face palming. You're literally doing my reaction to that exercise. Yeah, and I think that's something that people like, that it's an easy thing to sell athletes. Like it's an easy thing to be like, oh, we're doing this exercise because of this. Where it's like, we're doing this exercise. So if you're 210 pounds of muscle and you run into a guy who's 180 pounds of muscle, you're going to come up favorable in that equation. That's injury risk. Ma- it's the Iron Man thing. Like injury risk management is having a bigger stick than the other guy. It's like that's like, that's sometimes in sports. That's as simple as it has to be. It's like why I'm doing this bicep curl. Because if your arm is bigger than another guy's arm, his arm breaks and yours doesn't. Simple as that. I like that reasoning. It's got me this far. But it's, yeah, it's just like the hyper specificity in sport training, like creates like, and that's what gets you on like, you know, the morning show with like, I still, I still think it's Regis and Kelly, but it's, it's Regis is dead like these 30 years now. And it's some black guy you could park an escalade between his teeth. Who is this guy? Is he still, who's hosting that show? I have no idea. It's the novel stuff where people are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's like, look, it's not supposed to make sense to the housewife crew that watches morning television. Like, it's supposed to make sense to the strength and conditioning coach because that's their fucking job. But they're great buzzword words to put together and then it sells all over the media. Yeah, but it's not about, I mean, uh, you're obviously saying this from the same point we are, but like, people need to realize it's not about selling, it's about winning games because winning games really sell, right? Like, you should worry, at first, as a strength and conditioning coach, you worry about a stat called man games loss, which is the number of games you've cumulatively lost from players in the season. Then you calculate their wages and see how much those man games loss have cost you per team. Like, when Garoppolo went out, the quarterback for the... You, I said Garoppolo, and you're just like, is he a U.S. president? Like, who who was he? He came after Lincoln, right? But it's like he costs... One player costs a team $14 million. Between two players, Garoppolo and Street cost him $50 million on the bench. Not last season, the season prior. And it's like, okay, you worry about man games lost. You worry about the, the financial repercussions of man games lost. But then at some point, that's where most strength coaches stop. It's like, no, no, you actually have to worry about the record of the team. Like most guys go, oh, great. We've lost, like, you know, we, we cut the financial deficit to man games lost. We cut the amount of man games lost. It's like, yeah, you still went like 0 and 82. Like you're still a shit team. It's like it's it, you're a performance coach. You're not just an anti-injury coach. That's what leads them down the road of all this. Like we had a guy at Stanford. It was really bad. And, like, no one could listen to music. And, like, it was all hyper-specific, like, position work. And, like, it's like, no, no, no. They get enough of the position in the sport. Doing the sport. Right. That's the point of the sport. We don't need to do more of the sport when we're not doing the sport. To build resiliency for the sport. I hate resiliency and robustness are two words that if I could throw one to that fucking 22 bus right now, it'd be gone. (laughs) Yeah, but the idea of strength and conditioning for a sport is to fill the gaps that you're not getting from playing the sport, right? It's They operate on two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. I I mean, I wrestled my entire, you know, pre-adult life. I don't know if I'm still... You're not an adult. Now you're pre-adult. <laughs> but, the, I mean, anyone that's played a sport knows that at the end of that season, you are in, you're probably your weakest. You may be conditioned for that sport, but you're not generally conditioned. You're You're just very well fine-tuned to play that sport. And that's when, I don't know the stats on this, but I, I always remember a lot of the injuries happening later in the season because you just are deconditioned to any stimulus other than what you've been doing because your training is so specific at that point. So so in the off season, the goal is always going to be to start to build up those defenses and fill the gaps that you weren't getting when you're you know swinging a hockey stick just one way for, I don't know, how long is hockey season like? It's the basketball season. They literally start like late September, early October, and they run right into May, June. How many games did they play? 82. So it's literally the basketball season. And a lot. The, the confusing part is a lot of the teams share arenas. So like the Kings and the Lakers both share the Staples. The the Raps and the Leafs both share the Scotiabank or the whatever. or the No, it's Scotiabank. It used to be the ACC. So yeah, it's the same idea. But like the, I think one thing people miss too is like, 
you don't want to push the pendulum too far away from hyper specificity to all of a sudden like creating non-transferable symmetry it's like yeah like you said by the end of a season it's like you are you are not only the shape of your sport you're the system of your sport right like you become the shape of your sport and structurally and you become the system of your sport metabolically and neurologically like you get wired and tuned for certain work capacities in certain positions but it's like people who are trying to make everyone like stand up right with good posture it's like no you're missing the boat on the other end right like if you start in your off season it's like oh we're just trying to make everyone symmetrical it's like no no don't do that then he has to relearn his slap shot you know before camp if like all of a sudden he has the same amount of rotation in both shoulders it's like fly it close to the sun but no one wants to have that contextual conversation and be like, well, what does this person need individually? Where are they at on this spectrum and how do we get them to the other end? Where, or like better yet, where, how do we get them in the middle? So by the time, you know, you come off the all-star break or the trade deadline, you're going to the playoffs, you're not so useless that you're not putting points up. You're not so broken that you're not even playing. Kind of finding that middle ground and training in a way that's going to lend towards the end goal, not training in a way that's going to lend towards some abstract goal somewhere just because – you think that's where they should be. Every day is adhering to an intent. Yeah, absolutely. And doing that in a systematic way throughout the season and off season. And having an, uh, an understanding of the overall intention and then incrementally getting there towards that vision. That's everything. That's understanding of information writ large. What are we going to talk about today, guys? <laughs> Philosophy and intention in program design. My line of work being mostly around weightlifting, I work with people of mostly around strength and conditioning. If you're in a strength sport, a lot of time you are fucked up. People don't usually come to strength sports right out of the gate. So they're usually coming to things like this with some sort of lingering asymmetries or things that are affecting them from say playing hockey for however many years or coming from a different sport. So a lot of what I do is kind of undoing of these asymmetries or 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 programming around these injuries for people so that they can excel in strength sports and honestly that's a whole lot easier than than making someone shoot a slap shot at whatever 100 and whatever miles an hour a lot of times with that the underlying goal is always going to be creating stability and symmetry through the hips through the shoulders so that you can apply force in a meaningful way to a barbell that's, I mean, a lot of what our company is built around is being able to do so and do it in a systematic way for people depending on, you know, what prior injuries that they've been working with. I think in particular in weightlifting, a lot of what's lost in the conversation around how people start is that they come to weightlifting having lived other lives beforehand. And you come to the sport because you're drawn to it in myriad ways. Or you're drawn to it, you know, something is deeply speaking to you about it but you come to it in a condition that is front that is the result of everything else that you've done before it and you you're you're busted in some capacity and you may not even know that you're busted in some capacity and then you start training and then all of this stuff comes out and it's manifest it manifests itself in different ways and you're like ah the aches and the pains and the and this stuff and that thing and I don't know what I'm doing and it can be a big deterrence for you to continue to train. And like what I love about everything that we do is that it gives you, it takes the fear, it helps you take the fear out of continuing to do so. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the people that we've worked with come to us because they have residual things going on. In weight training, if you're moving around injuries, you're going to be creating imbalances or driving force into areas like the soft tissue structures. So, I mean, Jordan said it probably thousands of times, maybe millions of times. I only say like seven things. So I'm assuming <laughs> we're on thousands of times now. <laughs> the goal is always to outfunction bad structure, right? So, so whenever you have torn ACL or something and you have that injury, the goal is always going to be not to avoid that injury, but to do your best of whatever you're doing despite that injury. So building up enough stability through the hips and the lower body and and the core that you can do these things without any, you know, major implications for your health, basically. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to the specificity of the task. And the thing with Olympic weightlifting that makes it so challenging is that there's certain prerequisites that aren't demanded of you outside of the arena of Olympic weightlifting. Like you can be a, a, a good and to all accounts a healthy power lifter or 
bodybuilder football player for that means and not have the prerequisite mobility and stability to perform a task like Olympic weightlifting. Right. But that's, I think, in a lot of ways, what conventional strength and conditioning has gravitated to in the past. Olympic weightlifting, I don't think Olympic weightlifting in conventional sports, non barbell sports, really has a place in direct correspondence, but it has a huge place in functional correspondence. Whereas if you can integrate the systems necessary to get people into these positions, they are a lot more resilient for whatever the task is, because everything falls within the window of that task. Right. So like a lot of people are like, oh, like we do Olympic lifting for power. It's like, no, you don't. No, you don't because it's too it's too strong of a, of, of, a, of a learning curve to really drive the necessary competence in the movements to get that power up. I get more power up for a fucking box jump with with a with a 17, 18 year old rugby player than because I'm going to spend a whole off season teaching them, you know, the three different pulls in a lift and getting a barbell to the shoulders. Like, I don't have fucking time for this. Like, I'm dealing with baby giraffes, like, fresh out of high school. It's like, I can't be spending this time. And even at the Olympic level, because by the time they've gotten to that, le- unless they're Olympic weightlifting, like, as their sport, they have so much past and preconceived patterns that it's like, there's no, there's really no point. Other than if you can get them there, they are, they're hard pressed to succumb to any sort of, a quote unquote dysfunction injury because the demand of the task in the weight room is so great. Yeah, absolutely. It's this just hyper specific kind of like you were talking about type of barbell sport where where it's taking you know oh that was like fun and dandy with a squat or a deadlift to the far fucking end of the spectrum. We're gonna put this thing over your head. You're gonna be in a full depth squat and you're gonna hold it there with as much weight as you can. Yeah, you're free basing with a barbell. It's like hey, coke was fun. I wonder what happens when I boil it on a spoon and inject it. Yeah. So there's. I mean, honestly, by like you said, there's more. Even a back squat is high enough skill where to get you know a whole team full of 18 year old athletes to do something like that. That's that's a high skill movement, and for them to do it properly and with the intent of increasing power, where they're not going to create an injury or create some sort of movement pattern that may lead to injury down the road, is hard enough. And doing that with a barbell over your head, there's just it's just unrealistic to do. Eighteen year old college kids or twenty five year old NFL players. I was I was in the I was in the training room of the San Francisco forty nine ers in the last offseason and I'm looking at dinosaurs, like just different creatures. They're not even human beings. And I'm watching these guys move and it's like you have fifty five guys in a weight room. It's like fifty four of them should not be doing these movements. But they're so I mean that's the thing. It's like transferability of skill. I mean, why are we trying to get them these complex skill movements? Like, we're, we need to train shape and system. That's really what we're after. It's like, let the skill of the football be sorted out with a football in your hand, right? The, this, this, this hyper specificity is like, no, no, when you're, in, when you're in the gym, it's like, worry about training shape and system. Like, don't worry about the skill. That sorts itself out on the field. If your sport's like Olympic weightlifting, then, well, you are, you are sport specific. And if anything, you should, and I think most Olympic weightlifters probably don't want to hear this. It's like most Olympic weightlifters need to put on some fucking muscle. It's like you need to step outside of the specificity of the sport. Like, granted, a lot of the weightlifters I know are on copious amounts of drugs, and that's why they don't compete anymore. But it's like, hey, that bar moves, and they got a ton of muscle. Like, there's a bicep curl done in there at some point. So I took six months and got on our prescript hypertrophy program, and I put on five pounds of muscular mass, and it made me a better lifter. Yeah, absolutely. It's... Before anything else, it's a strength sport, right? Strength is buy-in. You have to have the strength to be able to apply the skill. So it's, you know, there's a lot of asterisks there. Is you have to have the mobility, the stability. You have to build the strength. But if you're not strong, you can have flawless technique and still be a really shitty weightlifter. And then you just have a thread on Reddit, from what I can gather. And you're just mad at people who have a bicep vein. Yeah, and you just love the Chinese weightlifting team. But even those guys are jacked out of their minds. Granted, copious amounts of drugs are definitely involved. But it's like, at some point, like, I think a lot of people miss, because powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting are adjuncts in conventional strength and conditioning, they miss the boat on the same principles that apply to strength and conditioning for sports needs to apply to strength and conditioning to the sport of the barbell, even though the barbell is used as a medium in strength and conditioning. It's like you still need to prepare and have contingency plans in your program outside of the barbell in the same way that the barbell is used as a contingency plan to the field, right? So it's like using dumbbells, using cables, using body weight exercises as adjuncts to your sport to fill in the gaps, as you said, in the same way that 
on the field, you're using a bar or in the weight room. When you have a field sport, you're using that barbell as an adjunct to what you're getting on the field, right? Where everyone just like, it's like that meme of the water polo player who's in water and takes his water bottle and is dumping water on his face. And it's like, this is the same kid who eats 200 grams of protein and is drinking amino acids before his, before his workout. It's like, I understand that there's a skill acquisition phase and it's always something that needs to be honed in on, especially with the high amount of skill demand in weightlifting. But at some point in the program, it has to be off the bar or the bar has to like you know, do a lateral raise, do a dumbbell overhead press, like introduce not a novel stimulus for the sake of novelty, but specificity to those holes in the sport of the barbell. Yeah, absolutely. Every kind of training block that I think of that I implement starts with more of a off the barbell kind of GPP sort of phase where you're working on building out the conditioning is a huge one, building out stability and working through different ranges of motion off of the barbell than what you're doing in say a peaking phase. So it always starts the, you want to start the funnel really large, get as many different exercises in there, a lot of variance with the movement, moving through different planes, moving different implements and then it starts to funnel down slowly, slowly, slowly and get more specific as you go through those blocks. So it's, you know, general physical preparedness phase where you might be on the barbell maybe two, three times a week as opposed to five, six times a week. And then it goes into more of a strength phase where you're doing maybe six to eight weeks to put a little more weight on the strength or on the squat, on the pools, push presses, things like that. And then you start to get into those power phases where you're converting that strength into speed and then it becomes sport specific into those last maybe four to six weeks where you're leading into competition and you need to know how to snatch and you need to know how to clean and you need how to jerk really well. So those three things are the focus. So you're starting maybe, you know, five training days with like, I don't know, 20, 25 different movements and then getting down to five or six training days where you're really working around like five movements being clean and jerk, snatch, squats and pulls. I think a lot of this also comes down to trust and the suspension of disbelief. Like somebody, like we write a program or somebody buys a program and they maybe, and they're like, I, maybe they didn't even actually really have an intention when they bought it. They're just like, I've, I've wanted to do this. And so I'm dabbling and I'm looking and I'm going to try to do it. And then they look through the program, but they don't really understand the design of the program. And the programs are, they're hopefully intended and designed specifically for something like that. They're periodized in this way that's going to get you to an end result. And I think this is part of like in a greater conversation about how we lose, we don't really have a comprehensive understanding of information at hand. Like we have an idea of what it means and then we do a lot of interpretation around it. And then the road to hell is per paved in interpretation because you know, the second that actually maybe we really, it, it becomes clear that we maybe we really didn't understand what we were doing then and now we're doing something else and then the whole thing goes out the window so it's the same thing in like skill acquisition you can't just max out every day and expect to get better like you have to acquire the skills first and then you and then as you acquire the skills then you're going to build strength and then you're going to get better this is here's here's how this is designed you may not understand that you're doing empty barbell work for you know three four or five days a week just hundreds of reps of something to acquire the skill to get better and then you're going to get stronger you may not understand that this actually is intended in the end result of you winning a competition or doing the best that you can possibly do and it's kind of like that roadmap like it's an operational roadmap it's you want to start here to get somewhere else or you this is the end result that you want to get to and then here's the map to get you there i think a lot of people don't they can't see the forest for the trees because oftentimes there's no thought in program design like there's not a th no one pulls the thread and like sees if at the end of that thread is the end goal like you should be able to at any point in a program be able to justify an existence of an exercise or a tempo or a, a volume or an intensity and i think a lot of times when you sell programming on the internet there's a certain following or a certain total you can have that just trumps logic and reason it's like luckily for us we're not that strong <laughs> So we need to be smart enough to be like, oh, yeah, no, week three, we're doing a contralateral load in a Bulgarian split swap because of this. Week six, we're doing an ipsilateral load because of this. Because, yeah, we're not strong enough to be like, well, look at my total. Yeah, that's why I love coaching is because I have the potential to be a way better coach than I ever was athlete or produce a way better athlete than I ever was. You guys are nothing to shake a stick at. The thing is, well, well we're not smart, but it's like, but we're not strong either. 
but it's like a but we can but we're smarter than we are strong i think yeah i 100 percent agree yeah because it's like it's give me someone with like whose parents are mike and louise shallow and i'll give you a real athlete because with with hobbit genetics and some supplements it's like all right he's, he's doing okay he can move a barbell but it's like give me a kid who runs like a four three forty in the twelfth grade. It's just like all right, this is the epigenetic bullet I need in my gun. Because you you pull the trigger on something like that, and you have you have an unstoppable athlete. Because I think that's something like we're not all created equal. We're not right. Like in the snowflake society, it's like all right, bring that shit to the gridiron, and you'll realize right quick. Go to India. Did you ever go to India when we were in school, the combine? So you could do this thing when you're in chiropractic college, when you could go to Indianapolis for the the NHL, the NFL Combine, and these kids are the same age as us, or maybe younger. Yeah, they would probably be younger. We're probably like 22, 23, and these guys are like 18, 19. And it's like you see them on the plane. They got like their varsity gear on, and you're just like, "What the fuck is this? Is this like if we were two species of animal, we'd be we'd be under different phylum and kingdom? It's like this is." This is human from like Jurassic area. It's me and Knuckle Dragon Junta. Like, Whoa. and then here's like Neo hominid fucking off in the future guy, like running a, like a four flat 40 and benching 225 78 times. You're like, we're not the same thing. We're a different, we're, I'm not, you're better than I am. Do not understand your fabric of being. Right. And, but it's like people don't understand. Like, look, there is, they, need, they see it most in sprinting where you can look at like atherometrics and symmetry in sprinting is, is very beneficial. Obviously, symmetry in other sports is not, but it's like they're just they're just different. But it's how many kids – did you know any kids? I knew this kid named Jesse Carrier. He had a bicep. Like Carrier never lift weights, shredded. Like maybe we were 16 years old, 17 years old. He was a year younger than me. And this dude was like jacked, like, you know, 16-inch arms at 16 years old. You're doing all right. As a Carrier, like – what do you like? What do you lift? Like everyone thought he was like running the jungle juice, and he's like, no, I just play Xbox. It was like, dude, if you just looked at a dumbbell, you and he's just like, oh, I don't really like working out. Wasted, just, right? But it's like, it's like he's different. I'm sitting there like pounding back 80 grams of creatine a day, putting chicken and eggs in a blender, and like just smashing it in my face, and he's sitting there with like an Xbox controller. It's like, what the fuck? And it's like you quickly realize that's like, okay, you have to have all of it. So, I mean, that, and that's the overlapping distributions principles when you look at, like, top performers. The end of the, there's a reason in, in Tokyo that four of the top eight guys are going to be from a small island in the Caribbean, and there's going to be absolutely zero people represented from Dallas, Pennsylvania. That 100-meter dash will never be won by the, the, the mind-crawling people of Dallas, Pennsylvania, or the hobbit-dwelling people of St. John's, Newfoundland. It'll never happen. But it's not to say that you can't make your best better, right? And relative percentage improvements, depending on what your starting like uh, competency is, it still can be a lot. Like there are people who are in nationals that like in, in powerlifting and nationals in, in Olympic weightlifting who've taken the smart route because they had to. Like you had Zach uh, Talender on the podcast. If, there, if I had to go into a lab and make an anti-weightlifter and perhaps of like a setter in volleyball, I would make that kid. Like, I met this gangly fucker, and I was like, what is he? Like, I met him in the Arnolds two years ago, and I was like, what is his deal? Like, I had no idea who he was, and I was with some friends. Like, oh, no, like, he's a pretty good weightlifter. I'm like, like, kettlebells? Like, what kind of weights are we talking here? And he's like, no, then like, with, like, Olympic. And I was like, special? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? It was just, but I, the kid knows how, like, you guys talked about programming. Obviously, there was a cerebral approach there because there had to be. Yeah, because absolutely. it's like if he doesn't have a cerebral approach, he's just playing volleyball. The only reason I've ever been good at anything is because I gave more of a shit than the people around me. I'm not necessarily gifted in any any certain way. It's just I try fucking harder. And it's like, you know, sometimes there is going to be a genetic or, or some sort of potential there that you can only reach this far. But the goal, as long as the goal is better, then you can keep pursuing that until the day you fucking die. But it's it's desire and interest and to continue to dive deeper and to figure it out and that you pursue that, you, you pursue the knowledge to have a better understanding so that you can operate better. I played soccer for almost 20 years. I decided in college that I wasn't going to play. And there was something in, there was just something kind of 
I had, I wanted to, and I was talking to the coach at the time, and he was going to let me do a walk on trial the, on the team. I went to a, I went to the University of San Francisco, and they played D1, and I came with good recommendations, and I was all district. I had medals and blah 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 blah, and they were like, "Yes, uh, you can come walk out and try out." But what are you studying? And I said, "I'm I'm studying physics, and this year I'm taking my this is my first year of college, and I was taking physics, calculus." chemistry and biology all at the same time so it was like nothing but lab courses and he's like you don't have time to play and at that moment I was like I'm choosing I'm actively choosing not to do this and it was something that I loved to do and I wanted to do it but I knew that maybe studying physics was more important and that's what I was going to do so at that moment maybe a trajectory of my life had changed now let's flash forward 20 years almost and I guess maybe 15 years and I, I'm in graduate school and I, f- and I was on a road bike to a party and I hit gravel and I fell off my bike and I landed on my left hip so hard that the right side bruised and I couldn't walk really. I like laid, I got to the, I got to the party. I had, um, had chocolate cakes in my bag and I was really worried <laughs> that I baked for, that I baked for the party and I was really worried that I had smashed all the chocolate cakes and that's like that's all I was really concerned about my, my bike is smashed and like I can't walk and I'm like the cake and so I get to the house and I like unload the cake out of the bag and then I immediately laid on a lounge chair with whiskey and that was me for the end of the rest of the night as I was just like internally bleeding probably so I go see my chiropractor probably two days later and i I crawled into his office. I couldn't even stand up. I crawled in his office. He adjusts me. I can walk out. And then I just kind of managed it from there. And so I always knew at that point, like, I've got, all right, I've got some shit on my left side and it sucks and I can manage it. And I make sure that I do a lot of, like, unilateral, bilateral stability, make sure my hip is okay. It tends to slip. So I've been, and then, and then I became an Olympic weightlifter, like years, a couple, like some years later, I become an Olympic weightlifter. So now, and I've been training, I'm getting stronger, I'm learning, I'm like learning all the skills, I'm getting better. And then what happens? Well, I'm starting to have some like, like a different, there's a different pain in my left hip. And then I'm about to go compete. My PT tells me I need to go get an MRI instead. I bow out of the competition. I have a cam impingement left hip labrum is completely torn and partially detached from the hip. Now, it had probably always been this way. I probably had a cam impingement most of my life. I played soccer as a kid. Bones don't form well, whatever. Labral tear, that could have happened when I fell off my bike. None of these things happened when I became a weightlifter. Maybe it detached when I became a weightlifter and that was the new pain I was feeling. Who knows? But the point is that I've been managing this in a very particular way because I was attuned to it I had an understanding of my body, how it was moving, and it was important to me to continue to live my life and to try new things and to get deep in that. I mean, I became an Olympic weightlifter because it's contemplative, and that's like everything that I am that I do. I like to think about things for a very long time <laughs> and then like embody the thinking about those things in some kind of dynamic way. And so there it was. Now, there was a lot of like fear around making it worse, doing things like maybe like blowing it up, maybe my leg falling off as a result, like if I continue to train. But that fear was mitigated by all the man- management strategies that, strategies that I already had. And then a conversation with my surgeon who was basically like, no, nah, it's going to be fine. And so I was eternally grateful at that moment that this is like, this is the world that I live in now. And that I had the two of you with me through that to help me kind of like digest it and figure it out. And also that the realization that these are things that all of us live, like we've lived, like we've all lived lives. We've all lived lives. We've gotten the shit kicked out of us. And, but to continue is to be, is to be that more knowledgeable, to have a comprehensive understanding of ourselves and of where we would like to go and then write a path to get there. And there's always a way to get there. Yeah. I mean, there's enough free information of knowledge. It's like from a collective standpoint that like, the fact that, I mean, the DMs I get are like, hey, I can't find anyone who knows anything about this. It's like, really? Have you literally talked to anyone? But it's like, it, it, there, it seems to be siloed in like a few groups of people who have like documented an experience like this. Like, I had a guy, I tore my pec like really bad. You guys were all, you were there. You were there for that. Like, I was, I couldn't get out of bed. Apparently, you use your pack. 200 kilos on the bar or something? Yeah. Yeah. On the bar, on the floor, on my throat, whatever. But it's like, 
that's like as valuable to me as the stupid fucking one hundred eighty thousand dollar diploma I have. Because like when the the kid in the U.S. Open who has to play Nadal the next day but has a torn pec gets my phone number. He doesn't have my phone number because I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> He's like, hey, I hear your dude who tore his pack and didn't have surgery. I'm playing Rafael Nadal tomorrow. Any advice? Yeah, don't fucking do it. It would be my number one advice, torn pack or not. But it's like there's such value in experience that I think gets like shunned the wayside. But like it's not like it's about like you have to experience it personally. Like like I can't tell you what peanut butter tastes like. Right, like it's it's like a kinematic proprioception. It's a sense, and it's like if you don't have a sense for it, like literally a sense for it, you can't. I mean, it can come down to empathy. It can come down to actual treatment protocol. But like, unless you've done it, and that was the thing when we went through school, it was like, how many kids flock the CrossFit route or the Olympic lifting route? Route, because all of a sudden. The the two kids who are barely passing all the classes, who are sitting there getting really sick at nine ball pool, all of a sudden are like crushing it in the clinic because like they've talked to people and are way better at shit. It's like how many people I saw doing dumbbell curls and snatches after. Oh wait, yeah, the stupid Jordans are doing all right. We're, we'll be out of here in like six months, no problem. And it's like, yeah, it's because there's there's knowledge in that. Like you, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know what are the classes, geriatrics. I don't fuck with old people. And I think that's what a lot of people, and this is the problem is you can't buy experience. Yeah, go ahead. Like, even, and I tell this to our coaches, we're, we're lucky with like the level one program that we have that everyone has the reps and they just need a little bit of, a little bit of a roadmap because we, we have the consolidated experience of getting, you know, here's Clem's history. Here's her, here's her fucked up cam lesion on her hip. Here's her fucked up labor. It's like, yeah, yeah. You know, unless you're in our profession, you might hear that once from like a colleague at the at the water cooler. But like that is our whole profession. It's like people who are just getting into this. It's like you can't like you can pay the money to register for the course. And this is going to sound like an anti-commercial for the course, but you can't buy experience. Right? You can buy where to look and hopefully buy enough theoretical knowledge that when you apply it enough times, you can be known as local authority. Then you start to siphon off the experience that way because everyone funnels into you. But you cannot buy experience right like you can put all the initials and fuck man like how many kids we went to school with have like the dumbest initial i don't even know what they are and i'm in the same profession it's like that, that means nothing it's like i would rather see kilos like i would rather see your total like i would rather see like you know three numbers listed in series after your name and if it was like if someone a guy had a thousand kilo total in pilot i was like yeah, i'd go see him 100 percent, because he's torn shit or at least known how to not tear shit that's my perspective on it. No, dude, I 100% agree. The more, the further you go down any of these roads, it just takes more to keep hanging on. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter what the fuck it is. It could be powerlifting, weightlifting, it could be chiropractic, it could be personal training, whatever you're doing. It's, you don't get the experience without getting the experience, right? The people that are doing it and they're living it and they're doing it day by day, they're getting better. If you know, I, hopefully they have the mindset that they're getting better with every single rep, every single client, every single hour, every single encounter or new thing that they experience. You should be learning from that and growing from that. And the people that aren't willing to do so will fizzle out. That's the trajectory of your life. And it's about choosing. Like I didn't, I chose not to continue to play soccer and who knows what would have happened if I had continued to play soccer. I already had a fucking cam lesion. Like I could have fallen on my head, got knocked with something and then like not been able to talk for six months. Like who the fuck knows, you know, or let alone like anything else that could have happened to my hip or my ACL or whatever else. And so where did the trajectory of my life go? Well, it went somewhere completely different. And then I became an Olympic weightlifter in as a master's level athlete at a time when I'm involved in an organization like this that is rooted in creating exercises to out function bad structure. <laughs> so it's not that we're saying experience, like I think it's easy to listen to somebody say you need to have experiences and then like kind of have this like panic existential freak out about like the experiences that you haven't had and then kind of artificially go create experiences for yourself just to have experiences but it's literally like everything that you are actively choosing on a day-to-day -day basis that with intention that gets you to yeah and that's like the skill versus habitude thing right like 
the only difference is intention between those two things. Like something you do on a day to day basis with or without intention, like devoid of intention, it's just habitude. Like it's just something you do. And it's like, think of the stuff you do every day of your life. It's like, seems like mundane. It's like, that's your whole life. Like you do cool shit every now and then, depending on like how averse you are to risk, but like, you know, getting out of bed and like making coffee. Calculate how many times in your life, like how much, how many weeks or months or days or years you'll calculate just like ordering coffee at Starbucks. Like it's probably been like weeks worth of minutes at that Starbucks across the street because the homie was like giving you the pound this morning. Like, hey, what's good, homie? Like I see this guy every day of my life. I'm like, yeah, that's that's your life. Now with intention of being like a nice person rather than being a habit of just like going in and getting your coffee – that interaction is positive. He came out and like, oh, like, what do you, you guys like all do CrossFit? And I sat there like mildly offended and just said, oh, like, that's nice. Jenta knows this guy. There's a skill to that interaction. That's the only difference in everyone else who goes there every fucking day is the intention that you go in there with. Right. And so it's like choosing your existence every single day. Yeah. And yeah. And that's like, and I think the root of that when doubling back to program is like, what the fuck's the point? Like, what's the point of this exercise? What's the intent? You're going to train every day. You're going to train every day for the next, hopefully, rest of your life or in a party program for the rest of your life. It's like, what's the intent of the exercise? How does this exercise exist on a continuum? It's like, like Killian using uh, the idea of having runway of progression, right? Like the BOSU ball pistol squat. It's like, where do you go from there? That is a short runway of progression. Do not do that because you can't continue to progress that. I know you're teaching a lot of trainers up in good life and all that stuff. It's, that's what training is, right? Especially if someone's seeking you out, looking for training, they're seeking, this is where I am. They see a picture of shallow. This is the guy I want to be. How do I get there? Aim low. But you need to, you start at the bottom and you progress them slowly, slowly, slowly. If you run out of progressions, your clients leave, right? I mean, that's not even in a business standpoint, but they're just not having progress anymore, right? So you need to start somewhere with an intent to go somewhere else and have tools and tricks along the way things that you can do to get from point a to point b and that's something that transcends training because it's like the one the biggest thing i've ended up teaching trainers teaching talking about i'm sure a lot of them know it to this point in their career because we teach higher level curriculum in the in, in within the company but like the the habit forming around their own lifestyle like how many of you wake up at 4 a.m how many of you wake up at 10 30 a.m and then it's the guys who are up for 4 30 a.m that have like that are level five trainers making whatever 70 bucks an hour or level six trainers making 70 bucks an hour. It's like, okay, how many of you guys are waking up at 1030? And it's like the kid who's 23 years old who like is half awake because it's 1030 and this is his usual wake up time. It's like intention, man. You, you, you both get 24 hours. He's making the most of it. He's, he's setting up habits with intention of being, you know, someone who can help people. Cause it's, I think at the end of the day, people are like, oh yeah, like, I got into training because I wanted to help people. It's like, yeah, but like I, I inherently want to help people. But if I don't have direction, like if someone asks me where to go, I'm not going to tell them. And there's a bunch of people out there like giving direction without knowing the way. Who it's are like, you helping? Right, exactly. You're just sending a bunch of people like off into Story Road to get fucking jacked, like just going to get knifed or like robbed at gunpoint. It's like, oh, yeah, no, that guy told me to take a left. It's like, well, he doesn't know any better. Oh, but I wanted to help you. It's like fuck no i don't have a wallet or shoes thanks man like but that's the majority of the industry we're in is people like oh like i just want to help people i want to be like a life coach it's like what the fuck are you talking about like have you lived at all look at your own life you're a mess not that and this is why we don't do life coaching because we're clearly homeless and a mess but like you know we talk about lifting weights it's like yeah i can do a, i can do stuff with a barbell i've done stuff with a barbell before I can talk a little bit about that. Like, I fucked this up and torn this off the bone and cracked this and broke this. Or I dealt with this guy who did that. You know, like, again, don't, it's, it's almost April, so we're not going to talk about taxes. But, like, don't ask me how to do your taxes because I don't have much experience there. But, like, barbell stuff, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of staying in your lane. Shit. If you don't know how to do something, don't pretend to do it, especially if you're dealing with someone else's health. And that's, I mean, that's what I really start. Like, I try and be, like, more, I'm more diplomatic than I used to be. I mean, six years ago, I, I put an Instagram or Facebook post up saying we should all pin Kelly Starrett under a desk and kick him in the head. I've since rescinded that statement. But it's, I don't know, like if I see something that I see as an egregious overstepping of someone outside of their lane, it's like, hold on, hold on. We're moving pretty quick in this lane. You're going to get run the fuck over if you come in our lane. 
because you're not helping people. You're helping yourself. And without turning this into another self-serving masturbation episode, like it's just we'll leave it there. But yeah, it's it's frustrating to see competitors in the space put out things that are self-serving and don't actually help people because they haven't taken the diligence to take taken the time to get an education or to even go through and get the experience at a certain point it's like bro how much do you bench snatch clean squat or deadlift comes into the equation is if not it's like if the heaviest thing you've lifted is a textbook i don't want to hear from you yeah we're still in the ring taking punches right yeah and that's the whole my my, my buddy's really big on that i think it's theodore roosevelt the man in the arena you ever heard that that quote but like that's the point it's like you want to be the guy under the bar right like every but not not many people really want that like not many people like Oh yeah, I tore my quad doing this, or I tore my pack doing this, or like, man, I really don't laid out for that spike ball and I fucked up my wrist. It's like you, you don't want to be that hero, man. You don't want well, you let, let Junta be the dark knight of spike ball, but you, you know you want to live vicariously through that experience. Like you don't want it. Do you want it enough to like fuck up your wrist playing spike ball? No, you don't. 